So how do we really acquire that skilled movement, whether it's something that you might do in hobbies or, or practice dancing or play a sport uh, or even learn to write? Well, we go from sort of the level of the infant that, that makes a single joint movement or tries to reach into space and gradually because we're interested in goals and we're motivated to get food initially or get our mother's attention, over time we switch those goals to becoming a better dancer or to becoming a, a better singer or to um, being able to, to do things more effectively, maybe get on a skateboard or play basketball. And what happens is the nervous system works with not just a single movement but with multiple joint movements. And so gradually by working movements together in synchrony towards a goal with motivation, we start to reinforce those movements and be able to do them more automatically. And what's interesting about the brain is that when I say uh, motivation, the brain has areas in it that are dedicated to appreciating your being motivated. The brain has areas in it that are, are dedicated to your paying attention. If we don't pay attention to how something's done, it's pretty hard to learn it. We have parts of the brain that are very interested in being a reward for having accomplished a goal. Now, unfortunately, some of those same brain regions about reward and about motivation are also tied into how certain drugs, street drugs, affect the brain. And they, in a sense, make you addicted because you go seeking that reward that's just the chemical as opposed to the reward for having accomplished uh, an action or learned something new, something novel. But gradually, we hone our skills by practice, practice, practice. It takes an enormous amount of practice to be able to accomplish simple walking. I mean, you think about a baby, it takes 12 to 18 months before able to get on those feet and start stepping. It takes another year to not look like uh, you know, you're walking on a rocking boat. Uh, and then it takes another couple of years before you can really begin to run or, or safely do steps. When someone has a stroke or a brain injury, um, sometimes you have to, in a sense, relearn those skills by taking advantage of spared pathways, pathways that aren't damaged, and try to turn those into a learning machine that can help you regain some aspect of that walking or reaching or language. But the idea here is practice. You've, if, to learn a skill, you have to go over it and over it again. And you can do this in many ways. You can actually physically practice, like riding a bike or uh, using a skateboard or writing with your hand. Um, that's a skill, and we call that procedural learning. You learn a skill that you can't really describe how you learned it, but you just keep doing it over and over again with the goal of being more successful, being more accurate, being more precise, being faster, sinking more baskets, whatever. Another kind of learning has to do with remembering information, events, things that you read in a book. Now, how do we do that? Well, information initially may go into uh, our hearing and our vision or our sensation, other sensations. And then that information goes into several areas of the brain. One area in, that back of, in, in the um, frontal lobe is where we hold working memory. Working memory means that you're still kind of thinking about that information. So if I gave you three things to remember, like the words peaches, newspapers, and Market Street, and said, I'm going to ask you about this in five or ten minutes, your working memory would probably be holding that information for the next few minutes until I asked you for it again. But if I came back a day later and asked you that information, you would have had to consolidate that information if you were going to fully remember it. And so that information would go into areas of the brain uh, called the hippocampus, where new information is stored. And then it might be distributed to other parts of the brain to be able to help you remember those words. Now, you might say to yourself, oh, how am I going to remember those words? Well, maybe I'll make up a little imagery about them. Like, I can see a guy selling peaches and newspapers on a street called Main Street. And 
that may help you then remember that in the future. So I'm now integrating that information um, within itself, those three items, but I can also visualize what a peach looks like and smells like and tastes like, what a newspaper looks like and feels like, and what someone might be doing on Main Street. You know, the whole neighborhood is out there. Um, and so I'm drawing on other resources in my brain to help me retain that information. So in a sense, if we want to learn something new, we not only have to pay attention to it initially to be able to, in a sense, repeat what was just said or done, but we have to then start to store it among our other experiences and memories. Now here's an example of a poor fellow who couldn't remember anything, anything new. I once took care of a physicist who had an infection that affected his hippocampi. The hippocampus is, sits in the inner aspect of the temporal lobes. All of our sensory information comes in there and it's a place where we begin to hang on to new information on the way to consolidating it for the long run. Well, this person had damage to both, of the, both sides, the left and the right hippocampus, and this is what happened to him. I would come in the room in the hospital to see him and I'd say, hi, Dr. So-and-so, uh, my name's Dr. Dobkin and I'll be your neurologist. And he'd say, oh, Dr. Dobkin, you'll be my neurologist. Uh-huh. And I'd wait 15 or 30 seconds and I'd say, Dr. So-and-so, um, who am I? And he'd say, oh, you're a fellow who walked in here. I'd say, would you remember my name? Mm, no. Do you remember what I do? No. So then I might do something like this, and I'd say, well, Dr. So-and-so, I've got out in the, out in the hallway a million dollars in cash that someone has decided to give you for your research. Do you mind if I go out and get that million dollars in cash for you? And he might say, well, that doesn't sound very likely, but sure, I'd be happy to have a million dollars in cash. And so then I'd walk out the door and come back about 15 to 30 seconds later, and I'd say, well, I have this box here. What do you think's in it? And he'd say, well, I don't know. And I'd say, well, I, could there be a million dollars in cash in here? And he'd say, doesn't sound very likely. So he's able to draw on his experiences in the past. I mean, there aren't a lot of people carrying boxes with a million dollars in cash in them walking into a hospital room. But he had completely forgotten. He couldn't retain this new information. And even when I gave him a hint, he couldn't retrieve that information. He basically had his tape recorder off. He couldn't learn anything new, but he could still do physics. He still knew about the world that he had lived and worked in, but he couldn't retain that he was in a hospital or had this encephalitis and brain damage or who I was, but he knew his family. It's just that he stopped learning anything new about his family from the time of the onset of the illness for the future. This tells us how not only fragile memory can be, but also gives us insight into how we can learn. That learning is by paying attention to what's going on, trying to put it into a context of th other things we know about, practicing, rehearsing, using that information in other situations, and gradually retaining it, hopefully forever.